Hello and welcome to the third episode of the HubSpot RevUp series, um, the series where we help business leaders affect top line growth and, we, and how they can do that through HubSpot. Today, we're talking about data-driven websites and we're talking about how to make the most and make sure your website is your best salesperson. And I'm joined today by Ian Guyver and Chris Dunkley. But before I introduce them and let them introduce themselves properly, um, for those that are new and haven't heard of Axon Garside before, I'm going, um, going to give a little bit of a rundown about how this webinar will work. And alongside that are sort of three key serve times. So if you haven't heard of us, we are a HubSpot growth agency based out of sunny Manchester. Um, we work exclusively within the B2B space, um, helping them make the most of their marketing and of their digital assets. Um, through our And we do that through our th three key growth levers, um, our tech side, which helps you make the most out of um, HubSpot with all your processes and data. Um, marketing, which again is as what it says on the tin, helps you generate more marketing qualified leads and websites, which again, we're going to be talking about today um, to help them become your best salesperson and help drive leads to your sales team. Um, so how this webinar will work, we're going to have a, a little bit of a chat for the next sort of 20 minutes. Um, and after that, um, throughout, so people live on LinkedIn, make sure to drop your comments and questions down below and we can get them up on screen and we can answer them at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, um, I will, I'll pass on to Ian. I know Ian's been on a webinar before with us, but um, I'll let him give a brief introduction to himself. And yeah, so I'll let yourself introduce, go on Ian, introduce. Hi, hi there. <laughs> um, if we uh, if we haven't met before, I'm Ian Guyver. I'm um, I'm the managing director of Axon Garside. I inherited the business, which has been around for a very, very long time, um, serving B2B customers with uh, marketing solutions of one sort or another. And um, um, under my time, we, uh, we um, guided ourselves through to being a HubSpot partner. Um, focusing very much on lead generation for B2B businesses. Um, my background before that was in uh, in sales for 15 years. Um, so I combine that sales and marketing knowledge. Brilliant. Spot on. I uh, might want to lift your mark up a little bit there, Ian. <laughs> it's popping again. Um, and Chris, how about you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the call. Um, my name's Chris. Uh, I'm the head of UI and UX at Action Garside. Really, I sort of started in the creative industry like back in 2003. Uh, my main focus has been on designing experiences all about the user, right from print back in the day through to digital marketing and, and website design. Uh, one of my strengths is that I uh, design with content in mind as well as, as the design um, for, for the user and what they need in the journey, which is one of the best parts of the job for me. Uh, so, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Wicked, spot on. So let's jump right. In. I think you've segued really nicely. Actually, talking about content and how you know how, how the content you put on your website and how you design those user journeys can be so conducive to producing a website that, and we say it quite a lot, a website that is your best salesperson at the end of the day. It shows of what you do, but it's also a wealth, a bank of information, so your prospects don't even have to. It don't even have to search around. They can just be on your website and know you're in that space. So. Again, this is a question I think to either, well, start off by saying, in your opinion, how can businesses best develop websites that generate ROI? Um, so I think there's, there's, there's two things. There's, there's an obvious thing, which is, um, which is that uh, a lot of B2B businesses, manufacturers in particular, are increasingly looking at how they can sell direct to their customers rather than through a channel. Um, and that means that, that even B2B businesses are starting to look and have been looking for a little while now at, 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 at developing um, e-commerce websites. So that's that's one very obvious answer. But I think that the, the second thing is really about an attitude of mind, um, which is to say that in the past, uh, people maybe regarded their website as, you know, that cliche that everybody talks about, the, the shop window to the world. Um, um, as we like to say, you're effectively being a brochure site. So if somebody knew you were there, were looking for you, um, they could go and have a look, check out your, your 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 services, check out your products, and compare those with other people who who sold exactly similar things. I think the the, the big opportunity though is 
it comes from the realization that most people, most B2B buyers who go online are not at the stage when they're ready to buy. They're not actually looking for a supplier. They're interested in trying to understand their problems, scope, potential solution, consider different kind of types of solution. And only then are they looking for suppliers. So the big opportunity, I think, to deliver ROI is e-commerce for sure, if that's right for you, but also to make your website the center, a rich source of information that helps uh, potential customers and buyers to think their way through their problems, find solutions and get that information from you. And that builds that essential thing, which every business needs, which is trust. The more you help people, the more they trust you. And I think that's, that's, that's the basis of, of, of the approach. Yeah. And I think you touched on it a little bit there. So just to revisit something else you said, just in that answer there, we, we speak about having uh, web uh, websites, businesses having three approaches when coming to build a mm. website and, you know, taking our one to factor. What are the three approaches we have seen with website projects and data driven websites in that area? Yeah, it's interesting. So, so when I first started working websites, I think pretty much every website that I came across, every website project, and including those that were done by us, were done as what I call Big Bang. In other words, people took a web, created a website from scratch or redeveloped a website, considered everything they might possibly want to say for everybody that they may possibly want to sell to, tried to get all of that information and put it all into one great big whacking website and do all of that in one go. So the typical thing is, um, and I'm, I, I know anecdotally this is true of, of, of many, many people, is that a client would come to us and say, right, we've got it. We need a wet new website in three months. Um, and that would often end up taking considerably longer because as, as the client went into it, it discovered that they weren't the same opinion on what needed to be said. It wasn't the same opinion on how the thing needed to look. Um, a lot more questions arose. The thing would take a long period of time. At the end of the, of the, of the project, everybody would be on their back exhausted and nobody wants to even think about the thing for another three years. Um, um, and then eventually someone would say, hey, we're not getting any, any ROI on this. And somebody would say, let's think about SEO. Uh, and, and it kind of worked in that sort of way. Um, so that, that that was that was that was then. Um, what's happened more recently is is people have got their heads far more around the, the kind of idea of iterating a website. Um, and HubSpot came up with a great language for this. They called it growth driven design. And if you Google that, you'll find there are a number of, of folks talking about that. And the idea there was that you'd have a minimum viable product, a small website, quick to create, and then you would iterate it over a period of time based crucially on data because the big thing was with the big bang is that you did a lot of educated guesswork and then hope that would work and then measured it maybe afterwards and found out that it wasn't so cool the idea of the mvp is you start off with something small and then you build based on actual data so that's a great idea and and, and that really got some traction going back two or three years the problem with that potentially is that works if you're a small business, it works if you're a startup, it works if you're going to change the way you use your website, maybe sell completely different products and you haven't got a lot of legacy value in the website you've got. But the reality is that a lot of businesses, say in manufacturing, have been around for many, many years, for decades, maybe even longer. Uh, and they've got a lot of, of, of SEO juice built up, they've got a lot of legacy value in their website. And so that, that kind of minimum viable, very small product um, website doesn't work so well for them. So then there's the emergence of a kind of third way, which says, look, the MVP might still be quite a substantial site, but the really key thing is we still need to measure, we still need to pull in data, we still need to iterate and change, um, not least because our customer's behavior is probably changing all the time. So what we built now, we don't have the luxury of lying down exhausted and then going, okay, let's look at it again in three years. Mm -hmm. The customer's probably changed by then. Um, but actually any business, that is alive and kicking and prospering and looking to grow in 2023, 24 is probably a business that is expecting to change, to change its products, to change its offering, to change the way it does business, to change the way it services its business. It's a dynamic, agile kind of situation. So the website you have today is not going to be the right website to say what you want to say about your business, let alone what your customer wants in 12 months time. So I think there's the emergence of a kind of third way, which is to take the principles of GDD and apply them to, to to the majority of folks situation, which is where you've got a legacy website that needs redeveloping and changing, but you still need to apply the data driven principles to how you how, how you iterate that site going forward. And I think I was going to add in as well that I think with just following on from that in um, that goes hand in hand with 
being able to with Rob's first question about measuring ROI and how do you create a website that produces uh, mm -hmm. a positive and uh, increases the ROI that it generates. And I think in order to do that, you've got to have the tools in place to track that data. So to, to be able to say, well, we can actually see that. So if you go back to your first example of the two different sites of the two different sites you can have, or you might have your e-com clearly, you're going to be you want you're going to be tracking your your conversions, and you're going to be you should be on the money with where where a sales coming from, how much cash is being generated. But actually, in our experience working with manufacturers, we know that when it comes to brochure sites and manufacturers that aren't selling through e-com, that uh, often there's a massive disconnect with well, we don't even we don't even know we don't even know where our leads are coming from. Um, and I think in order to have a website that you can see. Well, actually, yes, we can see that that's producing good ROI. You need to be able to, to track it, to see where are leads converting, which pages are, are pulling the traffic in, um, which pages aren't, you know, and, and that ties, goes hand in hand with the, with the data-driven approach. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I think, honestly, Chris, in my, my experience, that's um, the reason that a lot of B2B organizations haven't maybe focused on that as much in the past is because the mentality has been, well, look, I'm not selling off the page as such. I'm not, I don't have an e-commerce site and therefore I don't need to track those things. And, and in the context of a website where you're, you're looking to get a conversion rate of, 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 um, of, of anonymous visitors to, to context by getting them to convert um, through rich content and, and, and that kind of stuff, and you're aiming at a 2 or 3% conversion, actually all of those kind of skills and, and approaches that, that, that work really well in a B2C environment actually are really relevant to B2B people. But the fact that they don't sell directly online has maybe obscured that from them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we, you know, we, well, Ian, obviously you're on that webinar, but we did a webinar, didn't we? The first episode we did was measuring the value of your marketing. Yeah. And we spoke about that. We spoke about the importance. Yes, you've got your engagement metrics, your, your so and so forth, vanity metrics. Yeah. But are you actually tracking where those leads come from? Are you tracking them through the funnel? Are you tracking, you know, yes. how your, your pipeline velocity and things like that, which now are all, you know, with the changing state of the buyer and more pressure, more and more pressure being put on marketing to deliver these leads. Are you tracking them and you know through the website are you tracking where that's coming through and you know i don't know i'm listing a load of sort of reasons to start this leading into my next question but what are the big reasons you should start off with a launchpad site and build based off that data and build on that gdd sort of approach and you know we've spoken about the roi but obviously i know chris you put a couple of notes down here um yeah so reasons to to start with that launchpad approach and and to go with a a, a website based from data um i think there's three for me there's three main areas really the first one is that, that the data that a business will have it's because typically like ian was saying most manufacturers have existed for a long time mm -hmm. so there's usually data to go off to start with anyway um in terms of looking at you know what can we what can we derive from the data that we've already got about our users on the website. So how are people finding us? Uh, you know, uh, what what are their pains that they're searching for solutions to? Um, and also really looking into where their sort of potential threats, unknown threats are online, but also their opportunities. So there's that sort of setting the bar, really, that precedent um, for setting it, uh, like un understanding everything we think we know about a site's users. And then you've also got the whole process, really, uh, the whole launchpad process in terms of using the data to then drive the content, which in turn feeds the design process and all the user journeys that drive into that. And I think that for me, the critical one with that, that approach is then it, it helps to safeguard the SEO strength long term. So when you've got websites that where, where, where we excuse me, when we work on websites where there's um like a strong SEO foundation. Obviously, you want to maximize that long term, and that whole data-driven approach really helps to safeguard that for the client and for and for building on uh, ROI long term. Um, and then I think you know all of all of the all of the factors that are covered in in those two points really then sets the sets the tone for when that website goes live. It, the website's ready to drive effective marketing too. 
um, as opposed to as opposed to it being developed in like the Big Bang theory of well maybe this will work maybe it won't and then you launch the website and it's not converting leads <laughs> and you're sort of back to square one really so I think that would be my, that would be my main points. Mm. I think it's also worth saying that um, it's interesting that quite often we will um, will tend to be working on website projects where people um, the, the the reason that people are, are getting a new website is because they want to generate more leads because they want ROI um, and they want to make that move, which maybe hasn't been there before. But um, very often um, the clients we work with maybe don't have the right tools on their website to give them that historic data, which is why you have to make a bunch of guesses because you don't have that data. Um, so I, I think one thing that I would say to people is if you're thinking about redeveloping a site, even if you're not going to do that today, even if it's maybe something for 2024, um, and you haven't got some of the key tools of the measurement and optimization tools on your site, you probably should be putting those on your old site because that will give you the key data. So for example, uh, you need to be looking at Google and using Google to understand how people come to your, to your website page in the first place, what's their, what their intent is, the words they, they're using. You need to understand how they're engaging with the page. So you need to be looking maybe at, at heat maps, for example. You need to be looking at their journey and how, how far they go into the site and looking at not just at the bounce rates, but 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 what pages are clicking on, which you can do through through Google tools or you can do through a, uh, an all-encompassing marketing tool like HubSpot. Others are available, um, <laughs> but but you probably need to have that stuff in place, even if you're thinking, hey, I don't think my my current website is doing the job because it will give you historic data that will allow your website design team to consider those kind of things out of the box when they're building your new site. I think with that as well, Ian, we're still seeing lots of businesses that don't have the GA4 account set up properly, tracking the right. Um, the right conversions, the right interactions, mm. that would definitely be a great place to start and make sure, even if you think GA4 is there and, and, and set up correctly, get, a, get an expert to have a look and just make sure that you can see everything that you want to be able to, able to see leading into a new website project. Yeah. yeah. And I think there, I mean, there are tools that integrate natively with HubSpot as well. You look at things like Google Search Console, um, SEMrush and all these, uh, Hotjar, I don't think. So I don't think it integrates natively with HubSpot, but you know that's that's a tool we use to look at website heat maps and understand the sort of user experience on the website. Um, we've talked a little bit about tools there, but for someone, I think uh, for Chris here, um, for someone looking to mobilize a data-driven mindset for their website, whether it be a new website build or adopting it on their current website, what are the steps required to get started? Yeah, well, I think I'll try and keep it top level, Rob, because <laughs> it'd be dead easy to go off, off down a tangent and talk about each each element in quite a lot of detail, but I'll refrain from, <laughs> from doing that uh, unless there are any questions that come out. But I think there are probably six key um, steps to take, really. And the first one is sort of under making sure that really the business under properly understands and has got a really recent uh, appraisal of their target users so you know the pet, what are they looking for what they look what are they looking to what pains are they looking to solve with the business in question um and also again it falls back to the sort of ga4 tracking as well is that what's their device preference so it, often you'll see interesting data um immerse uh, or come to light come to the surface rather through j4 where you actually get to see you know god 50 percent, 60 70 percent of our audience are on mobile uh, or the other way desktop and quite often when you when i in for different clients i've worked for i might have had an idea about oh i, I would expect that business to have high mobile usage and then it's not because the data is there showing you that actually your definitely your website should be mobile first categorically mm. um or not and it's different for lots of different manufacturing sorts of businesses so i think that's a really the first key step is who are our target audience and how are they engaging with our website because that will really start to shape the foundations for what sort of website and what deliverables you need to take into consideration um then the second step is sort of the obvious one, really the SEO and content 
SWOT analysis. You know, where are the wins? Where are the uh, where are the weaknesses? Where are the wins? Opportunities, etc., which all feed into the data driven approach. And uh, again, a real good um, advantage of, of taking that step is you might uncover content that's on your website that's been there for 50 years that's not needed <laughs> it brings no value or equally that's been there for 50 years and is um helps to drive lots of conversions so it's really important to understand the value of the content that you've got on your website uh, a third step would be looking at the performance history of the site um it can be really interesting to if you've got the data to be able to look back over you know, a number of years in some instances where you could look back and see, you know, what uh, different uh, global uh, crisis happened that affected leads. Um, and in, in certainly in the, in the most recent, uh, like last 12 months, how has the website performed? So have your leads gone up or down over the last 12 months? Um, can you dig in to identify which pages have converted the most leads? And then this sort of starts to feed into your CRO, like the, this, uh, one of the things obviously that we do at Axe and Garside, the conversion rate optimization, is if you can start to identify, well, we've got pages here that have got massive traffic, but they're not actually converting into leads for us. Like th that then starts to raise flags for where well, we should probably pay attention and see if we can convert traffic from those, those websites, uh, sorry, th those pages in, into leads. And then, as I say, then you've got a little foundation there to build into step four, which is really assessing the, the user behaviors on those pages uh, for, for, for quick wins. Uh, so you've already mentioned Hotjar as one for heat maps and, and watching live videos or recordings of users on the website, which if, if anyone listening hasn't ever come across Hotjar before, just it's well worth, just have a look at it. You'll be able to see some of the cool things that you can do. Um, and just just to summarize it, you know, it takes recordings of users on your website so you can go and you can see watch recordings of users on uh, um, high traffic, low conversion pages and see what they're doing. Are they following the website pages it was designed? Are they not? Are they doing what you want them to do on the website? Are they not? And then you can start to develop solutions to those problems. The other way. Uh, of, of the user testing. I feel like I've been talking for ages, Rob. I'll be finishing in a minute. <laughs> um, but the other, the other way, so you've got Hotjar as one option, but the other way that um, is really insightful to do if you can is getting real people in front of your in front in front of a physical machine and getting to do tests. That's I've, I've done those before. They're really insightful um, and because you can actually speak to the person while they're using the website. And then really step five is, is as, as I mentioned, creating solutions to make things easier to do on the website. Uh, and step six is then just testing, A-B testing. And it should be happening anyway across your, your marketing and your digital work anyway. Testing of high converting pages, uh, testing of you know different ads in your digital marketing strategy. Um, so yeah, they as I say, I could keep talking, but I'm just gonna, they're, they're, they're my six, Rob, for you. Bomb. Um, yeah, and I think it, it leads quite nicely. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. I think that's re it's really, really good to have actionable steps that people can take um, to shift that mindset across. And I think one of the one of the um, roadblocks we see when we do things like GDD projects and we look at conversion rate optimization is that when website when businesses start with this this small like launch pad site, which is like five six pages, we often find that they want to just keep um, that people want to keep uploading business, what we call business requirement pages. Um, I think there is a business requirement versus, I'm trying to share my screen, but I can't at the moment. It's, for some reason, it's not working. But we have a nice graphic which shows, you know, if you're constantly updating your website with business requirement pages, they're sort of about us and not looking at the data. You know, over time, your results aren't going to, you know, your CRO results aren't going to improve. Um, Ian, we've spoken about this a lot in terms of how this works, what that meeting point is between data-driven, you know, having a real data-driven website, but at the same time having those business requirements pages uploaded and on the website. Um, 
I'm sure we can shed a lot more insight on that. Than I can. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Do you know what? I'm. I'm sitting here and I'm itching. I'm itching to have a whiteboard. I'm thinking I need a white. I need a whiteboard, but maybe that's, that's, that's too too much de detail. Um. Yeah. No, I think it's 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 really interesting. Is that going back to the motivation as to why people want to take the MVP? You know, all the things we talked about about replacing data, right? Guesswork and and the fact that your business is going to change and your customers are going to change. Um. Sometimes people take that kind of um, MVP approach not so much for those good reasons but because they want to try and constrain the budget. Mm. Um, and the problem with that is if you, if you, if you, if you create 30% of the website that you would like to have, and then what you do is you then spend the next six months adding stuff that you, that you would really like, that's fine in a way, as long as you realize that if you're focusing on doing that, you're not focusing on doing the, the making the changes to your website that actually come from that kind of great data driven process that Chris has just described, um, which which is where you get the real value. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, the more time you spend doing things that are entirely driven by what the business wants, the less time you spend doing stuff that's driven by data then your, your, your result and the optimization of your result is, is going to be effectively pushed off until that point. So it, it's always worth considering what does that MVP look like for you? I think, like I said a little while ago, the MVP minimum viable product site for you might be six pages as Rob's described, but it might be 106 pages. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and either is fine because in the real world, you have, to, you have to tailor things to your budget and your time and your resources. But it is worth remembering that if you're, if you're if you're not if you're, if you're not getting the website that you want out of the box um, to begin with, if your MVP is not not the right size for your business, then it's going to detract from from looking at that data and analysing that data and optimising your result. Yeah, exactly. And I think yeah, I think that was a really important point to drop in there. Yeah, really useful from that. So we I, we've alluded to it sort of the whole webinar, but you know one of the questions that um, I I personally had, but in in our experience. What are the telltale? I can't say that word. What are the telltale signs that people need to adopt a data-driven mindset to their website? Do you want me to go first? Yes. Yeah, I'll just jump in. So I, I think I think really there are there are two parts to this answer. Um, but the good thing is is that it's a lot shorter than my last answer. Um, but I think there are really for me there are performance indicators, and then there are some general points, and there's three of each. So on the performance side, really, you know, first question is, you know, actually our answer is leads from the website are continually below target or quality. So we've had a client mm. um, currently where they, they get lots of leads through the website, but actually they need, they want less of higher quality. So there's a question on performance, telltale sign number one, quality on leads or volume of leads. The second one is, that actually lead production has dropped over 12 months and when you don't want it to. And the third one is that you've got a, a massive reduction in traffic, which may have, may, has also, may have also led to the, the second point. So you've got those three performance indicators and then you've got, I think, three general points. Happy to take, happy to take an, an advance on three, but my, my, my top three would be in terms of, again, telltale signs that you need to move back to a data-driven uh, strategy would be that at the minute, if you're making changes to your website and those changes are being driven internally without any reference to online data, then th that for me is a, bit, a big flag. Mm. Also, if you don't have any visibility, we've talked about it at the start of today in terms of tracking of data. If you don't have accurate visibility of, of tracking data on lead performance and ROI, then definitely we need to you need to be looking at moving to a, a data driven strategy. And also if you're not A B testing options, so if you've you know if you've got you might have had a website in, in place for the last three years and if you know if you've got lead gen pages that are in place and aren't um, undergoing continual testing of Right, you know, we've got to try a different form or try a different layout. If that's not happening, then again, we need to, you need to embrace a data-driven approach. Hmm. Um, and really, if you, if I think my advice would be, if you've got, if you've, if you've listened to those six points and thought, oh, that's me, then I think the next step would just 
reach out to an expert and speak to an expert on on it um, to help to, to to get some clarity on on where you are and what your next step should be. Yeah, and we I mean we've noted down here to sort of talk about benchmarks as well from a from a conversion rate optimization standpoint. We see that many many companies have a fewer than one percent you know traffic to conversion rate ratio, whereas you know we often see that good site you know good sites should be aiming at that uh, three three around the three to five percent you know and and hopefully from that you'll gain greater insight into the people that are converting. Well, you can do it through HubSpot, can't you? You can see the people that are converting where they converted. If you've got CTA tracking on, you can see the exact CTA and you can monitor that whole journey before a salesperson's even actually had the chance to speak to them. And then from that, you can take those little sub-segments of data and be able to then edit and amend your website based on that. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really important part, especially, you know, not just from a design perspective, but from a marketer's perspective and a sales perspective to really understand that journey before, you know, even engaging with the, with, with, the, with your company. I think just to add to that, Rob, um, something you've, you've picked on there, which is almost turn a word a word of warning for people who are maybe um, wanting to move their website from a kind of brochure to to one that captures captures people's data, is that um, if you're not going down the e-commerce route, um, uh, and your traffic is coming not just from people who are ready to buy because you've got, you've got a nice high intent SEO onto pages of people who, who are ready to, to talk about buying something. Um, if, you, if you're going to get conversions through, say, ebooks or through online tools and that kind of stuff, uh, is that you will find that that, that that conversion rate may go up from sub 1%, may go up to, to 2 3 and 4% and above, as you said. But oftentimes what will happen is that the salespeople will then reject those leads because they'll say they're not ready to buy they're not they're not people they're just people who are trying to get free information blah 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 yeah um, and they're right about that so um a really important part of this is to say well actually what we need to do is take those leads take that information take that contact information and use personalized um uh, email marketing to warm them up and take them down the funnel, as we like to say, to the point when they are ready to buy, when they are ready to talk to a salesperson, by educating, by giving them the information they need to, to do that journey in, the, in a way they want to do it, in a time they want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's really important. And the second part of that, the flip side of that coin, as it were, is, is to measure the ROI really when you're not in a situation where people are literally buying off the page if you're selling a half a million pound bit of bit of uh, uh, a manufacturing process uh, kit or you're selling um, high-end software is 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 that you've got to be able to measure um the leads and the contacts and how many of those go to the proposal stage how many of those actually generate revenue which means you've got a uh, a really important part of of this is to link your your crm and your sales process to your website, even if people are not buying off the page itself. And I think, again, that's that's something that people oftentimes don't do. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've got just wrapping this up, going into the sort of questions here. We do have a question here from Alison. I'm going to get up. And I think it, um, what you mentioned really ties in quite nicely with this. I'm just going to read this out and then hide it because it's quite a big question. But are there any current trends in B2C UX slash website that you will anticipate B2B businesses will adopt to enhance lead generation in the upcoming year or any trends that we should anticipate for 2024? Now, just to sort of give my two cents on this from my perspective, I think I think looking, I think like Ian said, when you're when you're dealing and you're selling half a million pound, million pound worth of products on it, people aren't going to buy off the page. They're going to want to speak to a salesperson. They're going to want to be reassured into that sale. But if you are planning on running an e-commerce sort of style of site and that direct to consumer model, I think something B2B businesses can take from B2C is things like, and we speak, we've got a couple of use cases coming up soon, but we speak about having um, abandoned cart sort of, you know, you can see when someone's made the effort to buy, but hasn't gone through all the way to convert. And you can make, you can have a look at that, send them communications and updates to try and get them to convert and come back to your website and make that decision. And I think it's not necessarily a trend because I think, if you jump on trends instead of actually looking at your customer data, I think you're only sort of you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. But I think that's a really useful example how B2C gets it really right. And B2B maybe not necessarily is as strong because that part of the journey has been really complex. Whereas if you can see it and you can visualize that data, you can then send those communications. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just add into that as well, Rob. I think the difference between B2C and B2B is that B2C do like personalization very well often. Mm -hmm. 
there are don't get me wrong there are instances where they don't but certainly uh in a in a far greater percentage of times against b2b so like quite often b2b messages in terms of abandoned cart will be really generic and really just not relevant to that individual user and i think for me that's the the biggest thing is really personalizing the content and it ties in with everything else that we do with with hubspot and workflows but it, it's just you know the per the it's like the personality of the message if it's literally just you know you didn't feel you didn't complete your basket as opposed to you didn't um was there something wrong is there a reason why you didn't finish selecting or completing the purchase of abc it's it's a different it's a different message there's more personality to the yeah. to it and i think that that for me is 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 what we need to drive forward to help to support b2b with i think that's a really great point chris because that that i think one of the things that, that that sometimes people do is they 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 say well um when you when you when somebody's buying a consumer product they have an expectation of the experience and the richness and the personalization of the experience they're going to get. But somehow when they, when that same human being goes into a B2B role and puts their, their per, B2B purchase hat on that they somehow, I was going to swear them, but I'm not going to, <laughs> somehow, they're, they're, they're going to accept um, less good experience. Let's say that a less good experience. And, and that's, that's, that's just not right. So that kind of Amazonization of the, of, of, of what's happened here, where people will expect to go on a site and say, and have content that says, Hey, people have bought this also bought this. Would you find this helpful? It might be, it, it'd be good for you to do that. People are expecting that same kind of experience. Um, the good news is that whereas if you went back a few years to get that kind of personalization was an immensely expensive thing to do, which involved loads of developers creating bespoke stuff, that that kind of experience is now very much out of the box in, in, in the better CMSs. So you can, you can tailor your content to where somebody comes from, what they've looked at before, what they what they've looked at on this visit, and, and and create that right kind of experience. You can change the call to actions and the next steps for them. There's a whole bunch of things you can do, plus the personalization of what happens afterwards. Of course, that you you should be able to get out of CMS. So are going to demand that, and you should demand it too. If your next website is if it's a if it's a flat experience, which is one size fits all, it's not going to cut it anymore. Agreed. I say that's a that's a proper good night to end on. It is nice. yeah. <laughs> that's a good place to get the um, Brilliant. Thank you for everyone that's attended today and has, has watched the webinar. Um, obviously, thank you as well for Chris and Ian um, for joining me today. Um, if you want to follow, we've got future episodes coming out. So if you want to see updates on that, make sure to follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we often get events out sort of the day or the week out after um, we do a webinar. So keep your eyes peeled. Keep um, uh, keep attending. Keep registering to attend. Um, if you prefer an email digest of these webinars as well, we've got um, a page on the website um, for signing up to the newsletter. So you just get an email digest if you prefer to consume it in that format, where you can get updates from this the HubSpot Rev Up webinar series. And alongside that, we've also got another podcast for um, manufacturing marketers run by content lead, Lawrence Chapman. Um, you can sign up for that newsletter as well and get the email digest from those episodes. Um, apart from that, Thank you guys and thank you for everyone attending and we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thanks Rob. Thanks everyone. Thanks Rob. Cheers. Bye. Bye.